We're in a fun time today. We're talking about church and state. Don't worry. Please don't throw any uh, onions on me or any tomatoes. I guarantee you that I will offend somebody. Can you guys do me a big favor? Can we give each other a little bit of grace here this morning? Okay. And so we're not going to we're not going to do any kind of politicking. We're going to see what the Bible says about this. Oh, Pastor, I'm so sick to death. Everyone's squawking. Everyone's flapping their jaws about this. I'm so tired of hearing about it. Have you noticed people begin to parrot each other a lot? Yeah, a lot of parroting going on, a lot of squawking going on. In fact, it reminds me of a man who went to uh, the pet store and picked up a parrot, and he was all excited about this parrot. The only problem is the parrot was swearing. And being negative all day long. And he was so frustrated with his parrot. He started giving it nice, nice music and gave it treats, spoke softly, and the parrot would not stop. The parrot kept, kept swearing and squawking. He got so fed up with this parrot, he slapped the parrot, and it got worse. So he said, that does it. I'm, I've had it with this parrot. So he put the parrot in the freezer and shut the door. And the parrot was, I know, isn't that terrible? And, uh, and it was called Peter. And he began to squawk and make a lot of noise. And all of a sudden, he got quiet. And the man felt guilty. He said, man, I should have done that. I'm, gosh, this is terrible. So he opens the freezer door, and the, the, the parrot marches out and says, I'm very sorry for any, dis, any difficulty that I've given you. Would you please forgive me for not speaking kindly to you? And he's like, wow. Uh, my ask, uh, why do you change of heart? He said, well, before I tell you, let me ask you a question. What did the chicken do in the freezer to get frozen? <laughs> okay. Thank you. I didn't, and I have it written down. I did it without my notes. Come on, everybody. Okay, well, there's a lot of squawking going on, a lot of parroting going on. I just want to encourage you. We need to laugh a little bit. Uh, can I just tell you something else? That God is God, and he'll get the last word. And that you and I don't hold, don't hold the world together. He does. And Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so we have to talk about these things. Believe me, I didn't want to talk about this, but I feel I'd be irresponsible not to talk about this. Putting our head in the sand and ignoring it, or being uh, super political or whatever, it's not good. What does God tell us to do? Last week, we began our series on this. We're going to end it today. What does God call us to do? How should we respond? How should we vote? We're going to look at that today, okay, everybody? And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say and, and this is what we're going to do. In fact, Jesus was pressed to take political sides. I don't know if you realize this, but Jesus was pressed to take political sides. And they, they, you have to understand the time of Jesus, you had the Roman government, which was over Israel at the time. Then you had the Sadducees, which were the liberal church of his day. You had the Pharisees, which were the conservative church of their day. Then you had the Herodians, who were the political class. Then you had the Romans, so you had all this going on at the same time. And they were trying to get Jesus to take sides so they could persecute him and find a reason. So they're very, very smart how they deal with him. And here's one of the ways they did that. In Mark chapter 12, what happened is, and they sent to him some of the Pharisees, the conservative folks, and some of the Herodians of the political class of people to trap him in his talk. So they want to trap him. They want to press him. Who are you going to vote for, Harris or Trump? No, that's, what, not, that's not what they're going to do, but you know what I'm saying, right? They're kind of like that. Okay. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And so you have to understand uh, what was going on in Rome was a pretty bad thing. You pay, pay to, to Caesar, you're basically agreeing what they're doing. And so some people within the Jewish community were zealots, and other people say you should not. And there were other people think you should. And then so... So here you have the politicians there. So if he said you should not pay to Caesar, guess what happens? He gets in trouble. And if he says you should pay to Caesar, guess what happens? He gets in trouble with the religious folks. So it's a no-win situation. It's the old cliche, he's a rock in the hard place. Right? What did Jesus do? Well, I'll tell you what he did. He's very smart. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why do you put me to the test? Bring me a denarius. And let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, whose likeness is on the inscription? By the way, when people challenge you with things, sometimes the best thing to do is turn around and ask a question. The Bible says, do not put your pearls before swine, lest they trample on it. Just because someone asks you a question doesn't mean you have to answer. Realize that people are trying to trap you. So sometimes the best thing to do is turn the question on them. 
And that's exactly what Jesus did. He did that a lot, by the way. He said, who's on the den- den- Daenerys? Daenerys was the coinage of his day. Well, it looked like this. You got the heads and tails before the football game? Well, there you go. So there it had. He says, well, tell me whose likeness is on there. And they basically said who it was. They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are of God. And they marveled at him and walked away. Oh, boy. So Jesus is basically sending, give the government what's theirs and give God what's his. What does that mean for today? It means this. Don't let yourself get cornered in a political argument. Our job is not to win a political argument. Our job is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So, Jesus was pressed to take political sides. And, and, I don't know if you realize this, Jesus was crucified for political and political religious and political reasons. I make sure I, it's a double positive. Okay, he was, he was actually he was actually crucified because he had political and religious reasons. That's why they got rid of him for. Because they said, you have to understand something, the Jewish people wanted a conquering king. They didn't want someone to come in on, on a donkey. They wanted to come on a bulldozer. And so they wanted Jesus to come in, set up his kingdom, and they thought, this is how God is going to act in our land. He's going to come in and get rid of those Romans who are killing Jewish people, who are taking tax money, who are doing horrible things. we got to go in and overthrow, and the Messiah comes. That's what he's going to do. Jesus does not come as a conquering king, but a suffering servant messes with their own idea of what's going on. They're so short-sighted, they can't see beyond what's going to happen in the future. And so what happens is there's so married to their theology and they're so married to the political status that they can't see what God is doing. Could it be today we're so married to a political class we can't see what God is doing? Could it be we're so married to a church way of doing things we can't see what God is doing? Uh, May I suggest to you it could very well be. So the Bible says as iron sharpens iron, so another man sharpens another man. So listen, everybody, we should be able to handle situations. Can we have some ground rules today? Okay. First of all, I might offend you on what I'm about to say. Guess what? I'm not God. Do you realize the Apostle Paul said to the Bereans, you guys are amazing because when I preach, you check what I say with the Scriptures. So I am fine. I am not Moses coming off a Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. Okay, when I share Scripture, it's Scripture. But I am fine if you have a problem with what I'm saying. I I don't care. Show me the scriptures. Let's reason together, right? And I've been wrong on a number of occasions. Can I say something else too? Can I be a little transparent with you? Uh, When I was in Texas uh, during my summer, uh, my freshman year, I was selling books in Texas in a little place called Center, Texas. Town of 5,000 people. A tiny little town. County. And I was selling books. There's a lot of stories from that. And I was selling books and... Stopped by a pastor's house and other people, and they talked about Jesus. And if I went to a Christian college, and they started talking about those people that live across town. Who are those people? And they used the, the derogatory comment for um, black people. They used that word you're not supposed to use. And they had no problem with it. And they called it, they called it the quarters. I'm like, what are quarters? And, and I saw how they acted. And then they, they threw me out of town because they accused me of being something I wasn't, which is for next week. And so, uh, can I be honest with you? In the deep, when I was there, I'm like, you know what? If this is Christianity, no thank you. And I want to rebel against Christianity because it was so awful. Do you realize, we got to be careful how we represent Christ. That's not Christianity. It isn't. It isn't ugly. Listen, I don't need to defend God. Neither do you. God is God. All right? False religions feel it important to defend God and fight for God and commit suicide in the name of God. God's fine. He can take care of himself. I'm going to stand on the truth. I'll suffer the consequences, but I don't need to defend God. God is God. You don't believe in gravity? Fine. Jump out of a window and see what happens. Right? I'm okay. God's God. You guys with me? Okay. So Pilate called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? What did Jesus say? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. 
right? This is not our kingdom, everybody. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So Pilate said to him later on, he says, do you not know that I have authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? What does Jesus have to say? He says this. He answered him saying, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been what? Given to you. God raises up leaders and puts leaders down. Now, you may not like it, but God rose up Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and they took the Jews captive. But God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. You may not realize it, but God allowed President Joe Biden to be president. You may not like it, but that's what he did. Okay? He lets people come in power and not come in power. God, listen, God will use people. In the Daniel chapter 9, it talks about that. He raises up kings and brings them down. And sometimes God will use adversity to purify his church. We don't know the whole picture. So let's be careful we don't become the Sadducees, the Pharisees, or the Herodians. We're children of the Almighty God. What does Jesus want us to do with politics? Politics, by the way, means people. Polity, people. That's where its root comes from. So you're, anytime you got people around, there's going to be politics. Okay? I don't like it either. I don't like what's going on. In fact, I was really tempted not to share today because, uh, frankly, I don't like to talk about things like this, but I realized I promised you I would. I'd keep my word. i try to be a man of my word. So it's one of these things, no matter what you say, you lose. Remember the, remember the old days of the mask? If you wear a mask... You're, you're, you're wrong. If you don't wear a mask, you're wrong, right? So that's how it is with politics. Listen, everybody, our job is to realize we serve a different kingdom. We are Christians first. We are kingdomites first. We are independent Christians who may vote Republican and Democrat. I, let, I went last week. I talked about that. I talked about the fact that we are like referees. We have a striped jersey on. We're not supposed to be in either team. We got the rule book. We're so, so supposed to speak it to each of them. We don't identify with them. We identify with the kingdom of heaven, and we vote, sometimes Democrat, sometimes Republican. This is what we're called to do as believers. But what did Jesus have to do with it? Well, in John 17, 22, this is what he tells us to do. He was praying for his disciples because he knew that he, he was praying for his disciples at the time. And then he began to pray for his disciples who would believe because of their word. And he's praying for us today in 2024, including this time right now. And what did Jesus pray? What is the attitude he wants us to have? The glory that you have given me, I have given to what? Them. We're supposed to carry the glory of God. That they would be what? One, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world will know that you sent me and love them even as I've loved you. So we're supposed to be one. What does that mean we're supposed to be one? Does it mean we lose our standards? Absolutely not. There's some essential things we must, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you must never let go of. The Bible even says, the Apostle Paul says, in Galatians, it says, if we are to preach a different gospel than you've heard, let, let us be accursed if an angel were to come down. If I were to preach a different gospel, the apostle Paul said, let him be accursed. What's the gospel of Jesus Christ? The gospel of Jesus Christ is very simple. Man sinned, right? We're not worthy of heaven, but Jesus came and paid the sacrifice for us because he loved us so much. We have to receive him as our Savior and our Lord. And that's the basics, Right? So we believe in the tent. We have closed hand issues. What's closed hand issues? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus rose again from the dead. But that's a closed hand issue. Another closed hand issue is the Bible says all Scripture, right, is right for correction. Even the Apostle Paul said the gospel, and the gospel is right here. We believe the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible. We believe this contains the Word of God. It's inerrant in theology, and this is our final authority. This is not a buffet. We don't pick out stuff we like and leave the others behind, although we often do it a lot of times. But this is our final authority. That's what, that was a closed hand. Whether we sing hymns or wear robes, whether we uh, meet on Saturday or Sunday, whether we have different music, those are secondary, third issues. 
even women in ministry and baptism of the Holy Spirit, those are important things, but they're not essentially for salvation. Do you follow me, everybody? Let me give you an example. How many like ice cream? When I get to heaven one day, God waters everything that tastes good is bad for you. <laughs> in heaven, I'm going to have as much ice cream as you want, much as meat as you want. Anyhow, but it'll be meat plants in heaven. No animals will be killed in the making of this heaven. But anyhow, so imagine what is ice cream? Ice cream simply is what? Is ice, cream, mixed together. So you can have bland ice cream and have no flavor to it. You have vanilla ice cream, right? Chocolate ice cream. So you have cream, sugar, and ice put together, and you have ice cream. Some ice cream is very bland, vanilla, chocolate. Some are rocky road, right? Some have nuts and flakes in it. You know, that's just ice cream, right? But the main thing is, well, I like pistachio nut. I like rocky road. I think vanilla is the only way. King James vanilla. <laughs> Forget haagen It's King James vanilla. And so people will argue and split over it. It's silly. What's the main thing? Jesus is Lord. The Bible is the word of God. God created them both male and female. And these are essential things. And he called it good. Right? Those are essential things. The other stuff? Now, sherbet looks like ice cream. But what is sherbet? It doesn't have milk in it. There are churches out there that have rainbow sherbet and all in there. All kinds of different sherbets, right? They're sherbet. They have all kinds of sherbet in it. They're not ice cream. I'm going to call it, why? Because they deny the cream, and the cream is Jesus. Do you follow me, everybody? Okay? So, we're not talking about leaving the Bible behind. No, we're going to stand on what the Word of God says. The Bible is very clear. The Apostle Paul said, anyone preaches a different gospel than we preach to you, and the gospel he gave was Jesus Christ. And his scriptures were, a lot of, were written already. Okay? You follow me? Okay? So, and that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them. So now Jesus gives us a new commandment. Are you guys ready? What's our commandment for the church? This is the most important commandment. Let me say something else. Guess what the most powerful force in the universe is? God. Okay, besides that, you guys read my notes. Love. Why is it love? Before God created the universe, before he created all the angels and everything else, you had God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, before anything ever was. And they had a relationship, three but one, and they had perfect love. What birthed the universe and all the, all the different universes out there was the love of God birthed all creation, both seen and unseen, different principalities, all came because of the love of God. So what's the most powerful force in the universe? Love. If I have not love, I am what? Nothing. Agape love. So the love of God, God is the essence of all love. All right? So, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. What does commandment mean? You got to do it. You go through a red light. Well, I didn't want to go through a red light. Well, I'm sorry. It's a law. It's an imperative. This is an imperative. New commandment. I love each other. And the word for love there is agape, which simply means I'm going to love you regardless of how you treat me. Love each other just as I've loved you. You should love each other. You love for one another will prove the world that you are my disciples. So we can disagree around the kitchen table, but once I step out of the house, we are one. My brother Glenn one time went to a mall, and this guy was bad-mouthing this woman and was, was pushing her against the car and treating her terrible. My brother Glenn got in the middle of it and said, what are you doing? And then the woman and the man turned to my brother Glenn <laughs> because they were, they were like girlfriend. I don't know what was going on. So, you know, and you may not like your family, but don't mess with my family. All right, so this is how that works. How shall we respond to the government and the elections? We got to live in love and be in love, right? How are we supposed to respond to it? Here's another one. A candidate, it's going to happen. A candidate will be based, will win based on what happens on November 5th. That's going to happen, though we don't know what's going to happen in the world right now. Getting kind of crazy. Here's the second thing I know. But the church will win based on our actions before during and after November 5th. What happens in the elections is not as important as what happens inside of you. What happens in our heart and how we treat each other is extremely important. And 
as a part of Jesus' church, change happens by our what? Our actions, not our opinions. Do you know like only like 40% of the church votes according to different statistics that are out there? You can have all the opinions you want, but until you vote, nothing really happens, right? You got to pray. You got to vote. So listen, everybody, your opinions don't mean much. Your actions mean a whole lot more. Jesus made it very clear in Scripture about that as well. So what about the government? What about the elections? I'm so glad you asked because the Bible is not silent about this. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the Roman church, and uh, Rick, uh, Rick Totten is doing an amazing job. Uh, Roman book study, by the way, if you haven't signed up for it, I don't know if any space is available, you're doing through a, a book study. Romans is one of the greatest books of the Bible. He has so much great theology. The Apostle Paul wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is Holy Scripture, and this is what he talks about, about government and what it means, and this is what he understands from the Holy Spirit, and it agrees with the rest of the Bible. Here it is. Let every person, look at yourself, look at your neighbor, say, you're a person. Let every person be subject. What does subject mean? Subject, under. God gives authority to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, including bad government. Hello. Let me just stop you for a moment and let me give some context to what's going on. Do you recognize that a bad government is better than no government? That's not true. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Go to different places in the world right now. We, Dr. Franco, who comes from Haiti, right? Haiti right now is horrific what's going on in Haiti. Because there's no oil, because there's nothing that people care about, we're leaving them alone, which is a, which is a tragedy within itself. In Haiti right now, there is no government. Right now, it's gangs in the street. It's anarchy. You'd be better off in North Korea right now than to be in Haiti. Dr. Franco said, I'd rather have Kim Jong-un in running the country of Haiti right now than what's going on. Because at least we wouldn't be killing each other in the streets. It's bad. So not having government is not a bad thing. God cares about people. So even a bad government, and by the way, the Roman government was not the American government, everybody. It was, you didn't have the rights we have today, okay? So the Apostle Paul is writing to a tyrannical government. This is not a good government. You didn't have the freedoms and rights we have here in the United States. So this is the context of it. They were killing Christians, arresting Christians, killing people. Not a good thing. What does the Apostle Paul say? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Yes. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. That means if you don't obey the law, you're in trouble. Now, let me make something very clear. The Bible also says, In the book of Acts and other places, Apostle Peter said, we must obey God rather than man. When the government asks me to do something that goes outside the scope of God's authority, especially in essential issues such as life, I have an obligation to obey God rather than man. This is why Jesus was killed. This is why the Apostle Paul was beheaded. This is why almost all the disciples except for John were killed. Because they would not subject themselves to not spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you follow me? We're not talking about some wimpy Christians here. We're talking about as long as they follow God, but if they step out of that, I'm talking on big issues, then we have an obligation to follow God rather than man. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Hello. We had Joseph under Egyptian rule, under Pharaoh. He did an amazing job, and he rose to the top of leadership. We have Daniel under three different administrations. He rose to the top. Do you follow me, everybody? You see that? Okay, it's important we understand that. Then do what's good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant. That's right. The people. That's right. Joe Biden is God's servant. Even Vladimir Putin is God's servant. Why? Because he's over Russia. At least they're not, there's, there's some sort of order. Now, I'm not saying I agree with Vladimir Putin. I'm not saying I agree with Kim Jong-un or anything else for that matter. But it's better than chaos, right? For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God and an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. 
Therefore, one must be subject not only for avoids God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Oh, gosh. You really? Yeah. Render to what's God's God's and Caesar Caesar's. You should tithe and you should pay your taxes. For the authorities are, you don't have to pay more than you have to, though. That's why you need a good accountant. Okay. For the authorities are ministers of God's attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. R-E-S-P-T, right? Respect <laughs> to whom respect is owed. Hello. Listen, I like to have fun. I like to joke around. But when we begin to make derogatory comments about political candidates and dehumanize them and call them raka, which means fool, the Bible says we're in danger of the fires of hell. Be careful with the rhetoric, everybody. Everyone's made in the image of God. You may disagree with them, but you have no right to say slanderous, angry, and damaging things with your mouth. It's wrong. The Bible is very clear about that. Even in the book of Jude, it talks about when Moses was disputing, I'm sorry, when Ar Michael, the archangel, was disputing over Moses' body, he did not bring accusation. He said, be gone, Satan. So we say what's right, we is wrong. We don't, all need to go, uh, we don't need to call people. The cat's got my tongue, but we're not, not going to get into that. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Oh, no one anything except to what? Love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments are summed up in this one word. This is all the same passage, everybody. What's the one word? You shall what? Love. Agape. I'm going to love them, whether they like me or not. I'm going to love the Democrats. I'm going to love the Republicans. I'm going to love people that are different than me. I'm going to love people that hate me and love me. Anyone can love someone that, that, that loves them. That's easy. Try loving someone who hates you, right? Love your neighbor. And who's your neighbor, as they asked Jesus? Well, Jesus gave the illustration of the Samaritans. Samaritans were hated by the Jewish people. And the religious community blew off the person that was laying sick. But the Samaritan was the one that took care of him. He said, Jesus says, that's your neighbor. So we are to love people that are different than us. Doesn't mean we accept what they do, but we love them. We shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So we're to love everybody. Let me just say a couple of quick things about government and why government was even established. Okay, God created them both male and female and called it good. We see it in the book of Genesis, right? And then what happened? You had family. Then families had children, had more children, more children. Now you have a clan of people. Then they separate, another clan over here. Then you had clans, then you had tribes, nomadic tribes. Then they began to make cities, walls. And then they had what? They had kings. Kings would make the families flourish. Why did government come in the first place? Government is there to allow a family to flourish. Now, I understand that everyone is going to get married and have children. I understand that. Jesus was not married, neither was the apostle Paul. But without having children, there's no next generation. So the job of a family is to live, right? And so what happened was once you had a clan, a tribe, then you had government. The government is supposed to support the flourishing of families and a rule of law. That's what government's supposed to do. All right? So what has happened is now the government's supposed to help us to flourish. What happens when the government comes against flourishing and has laws that actually hurt the family? Then it's a problem. And we, and we being a representative form of government and having power to vote, having power to run for office, should make be salt and light to change what's going on and stand up for the unjust that's taking place. We should stand up for the unborn, right? The Bible's very clear about it. And let me say something very clear. I understand there are people here today I, I don't need to be a prophet. Maybe you were part of a pregnancy that not, was not fulfilled for a variety of reasons. Perhaps you participated in ex, an, an abortion. God loves you and wants to forgive you. He's not, he does not want to damn you. He wants to save you. We all make mistakes. God forgives. Is that clear, everybody? It doesn't mean we say it's, it's, it's correct. The Bible says, while I was in my mother's womb, you knit me, you formed me. John the Baptist leapt in his his mother's womb when he, when he saw Jesus. We know that that's important. We care about life from the womb to the tomb. We're supposed to care about people. 
Do you realize in not too, not the too distant future, what's going to happen is euthanasia is becoming law in our land. So now we have mom and dad they are getting kind of old. You're kind of senile a little bit. They have a lot of money. It's costing us about $250,000 a year to take care of them. And we're going to lose all our inheritance. So mom and dad, hey, guys, come out. Let's go get something to eat. Hey, mom and dad, listen, you know, you got grandchildren, you got this and the other, and we just signed this document, you know, don't you want to have dignity and what's going to happen? They're going to sign their death warrant, not even know what's going on, and we're going to kill our parents. You think I'm making this stuff up? I'm not. We need to care about the womb to the tomb. We stand up for life. Okay? So, policies are important. But people are more important than policies. However, let me say something. Well, we'll get more to that later. All right. What about the government and the elections? All right. Humpty Dumpty, America. You guys know the, the scripture verse in, in uh, Eric 3.18, right? <laughs> Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, in many ways, America has fallen, haven't we? And America is kind of a wreck, kind of like this, okay? And all, you can have Congress pass laws. We got to do something about Humpty Dumpty. So what do they do? They pass a law, no sitting on the wall anymore. Okay, Humpty Dumpty needs to be cooked more so you have more choke. So then you have the Supreme Court passing laws and you have Congress. Is that going to save Humpty Dumpty? No. What saves Humpty Dumpty, what saves America are not laws, it's a savior in Jesus Christ. The answer for our world today, laws matter, but more important, God cares more about men's hearts because you can have all the laws you want, but if you don't have their hearts, everything changes in that regard. So Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. Now, what does this all mean for our election? Well, this is what we need to do. Submission to God above party. We need to pray for our th those who are over us. Very clear. We talked about that last week. And get truth. Do your homework. It's hard to do your homework, is it not? Get the truth. Be informed of what's right and what's wrong. We stand up for things the Bible talks about, non-negotiables. We talk about life. God created them male and female. It's child abuse to tell a child before they're old enough to say, oh, we don't know what you are. That's child abuse. To be counseled to take hormone therapy is, is child abuse. How could you say that? It's pretty clear, everybody. Okay, now, if they close us down because of that, oh, well. But we, we don't hate them. They're misguided. Remember, everybody, there's a couple things you need to remember. Number one, every single person is made in the image of God. Do we got that? And God loves them and calls them to himself. That's what he wants. Number two, everyone's fighting a battle you know nothing about. And number three, we ought to choose love and stand strong. So those are things we have to understand. Get truth. Do your homework. Now, I looked around. You know how hard it is to find nine-partisan voter guides? I mean, I read one. They want to rip the, out of, you know, they have all these, like, inflammatory writings. Well, these are a couple I found are pretty good because the Bible says this, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. There's a lot of false narratives out there about different candidates. Even the candidates themselves are very tricky. Show me the facts, ma'am. Show me the facts, sir. And so here's a couple of places I find very helpful. Let's get a screenshot of this. iSideWith.com is a nonpartisan thing. What you do is you answer questions about what's your view of life, and we need to look at the Bible. And you answer these questions. And it's pretty, I, I did it, I, and, and it comes out with the candidates based on your zip code that believe what you believe. And we take a biblical worldview because we believe God's word is true. Another one is my faith votes, and it shows you what the Bible says about different topics. So these are two, just a little start. Take a screenshot, look at it later on today, get informed. What does the Bible say? I don't care about my opinion. I care about the word of the Lord. We got to stand on that. We got to stand on that. Okay, another couple seconds. All right, you guys got that? All right. And Vote. You need to vote. If you're able to vote, register to vote and vote. Mo mostly local elections, you have more effect. Act locally and nationally. And let me say a couple of the things. Our love and unity will be proof of his, of his reality in our lives. That's what it's about. And what are we going to do? As a part of Jesus Christ, our goal is not 
total agreement, but total love. Now, I'm going to get a little controversial here for a second. Can I do that without you being upset with me? Okay. I have some dear friends. I've spent a lot of time uh, in researching this, and I, believe me, I have so much information. I could go on for weeks. We could, we could have a sermon for each of those social issues. But I have some friends of mine that I love. I have a friend of mine that's one of my mentors, a very spiritual man who loves Jesus, who flows into spiritual gifts, who's an amazing man, has been through a lot of stuff. Another friend of mine, similar. This one friend of mine, please, can you guys listen and not judge, okay? And I'm not telling you my stance. I'm just telling you there's different stance out there. I'm taking a risk by doing this, but we need to be real. Can I be real with you for a few moments? Can I be transparent with you? Okay? Remember, you should know the truth. Don't worry about it. So one guy I know says he cannot vote, now I, whether you agree or not, he cannot vote for the Republican Party's top ticket for the president. I'm like, dude, why not? And he explained the reason why. And the reason why he said that, I'm just, I'm just saying that messenger, don't shoot the messenger. He believes that the rule of law is so important that he sees the candidate of that party that's going to destroy the whole rule of law and there'll be anarchy. So he sees it many years. Now, whether he's right or not is debatable for sure, but that's what he believes. Okay? And for that reason, he's not going to vote for the Republican ticket. I have other folks that are going to abstain completely. Other folks who are going to vote for the Democratic ticket, not the Republican ticket. And those other people are going to vote for a Republican because they feel it's so important to, to not view life. But then, let me tell you some facts. Do you realize that the Republican ticket, the, the person in charge right now, from what I can ascertain, uh, thinks abortion up to 15 weeks is okay, has not come strong on that one? And most abortions happen in the first 12, 10 to, uh, first up to 12 weeks? So there's a lot, of, a lot of playing around going on, a lot, a lot of shell game going on in the politics right now. So it's not as simple as you think. We have to vote the Bible. we got to vote the truth. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Righteousness exalts a nation. Now, when the Bible talks about life, right, the unborn, that's important, right? When life talks about how to treat each other, that's important. So those are non-negotiables. And then there's other areas. How do we help people the less fortunate than us? How do we help the poor? There's different philosophies of how you do that. We should give grace to each other. So what I'm trying to tell you is there are some believers that are not going to vote like you vote. You should be able to have a conversation with them and listen and ask. But never, never, ever turn away from the Bible. The Bible is, ex is a crystal clear about life, about sexuality. It's very clear about it. Hello. So we stand on those things. But I have some friends that are looking 20, 30 years ahead, and they take a different tact. And I have to give them grace. And I have dialogue with them. We're going back and forth, talking about it. We disagree at various times, but we still love each other. And I know they love Jesus. Now, I know they made you feel uncomfortable, but that's what's going on. Can we be Real men and women here and not, listen, Jesus died for you on the cross. Not Kamala Harris, not Donald Trump. America is not the promised land. Israel is. Hello? <laughs> Try to find America in the Bible. You can't find it. Nations come, nations go. I love America. I'll fight for America. And I love America. But I love the kingdom of God more. Shall we pray? Amen. So, Lord, we know we got to choose love above all else. And Jesus, not the sappy love the world gives us. We're talking about the love that lays down his life and dies on the cross. The same love that judges men and women. The same love that there's a place called eternal hell and heaven because you love. And love must have justice. But right now, we're in a season of grace where people can turn to you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we be godly men and women, that we become informed, Lord God, that we would vote what your word says. We know that righteousness exalts a nation. A sin is a disgrace to all people. And Father, we want to stand up for the unborn. We want to stand up for the elderly being abused. We want to stand up for people that are marginalized in our society, that we are called as a church to reach out to those as we're doing. 
So, Father, we also call to pray. Lord, we're asking in Jesus' name, Father, that you would expose all the lies from both candidates. Lord, we pray all the trickery of men would be seen for what it is and that we would clearly see where each party believes that we could choose the Word of God and vote the Bible in patience and love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. 